Today we are going to learn how to implement Firebase security rules for your real-world application. Welcome to DevWorld, my name is Sam. Today I'm going to show you what Firestore security rules might make sense for your real-world application. In the last video I covered how to set up the rules environment, so if you haven't seen the video, make sure to check it out. The link to the video is in the description down below. As you already know, Firestore is a NoSQL database. I personally really like the flexibility that comes with that, but on the other hand, everybody can technically write any kind of data with any kind of key value pair. Of course, our client-side app, in this case our React application, has only a limited number of fields, but we know that client-side data can't be trusted. And with some small tricks, technically any hacker can write to your database with whatever he or she wants. So today I'm going to show you some rules I think are good practice to implement. I'm also going to show you how to do that easily with a helpful tool I built. First, let's check out our React app. And don't worry, like in the last video, if you don't know React, this tutorial still applies to you if you use a different framework or vanilla JavaScript. So this is our school directory. And today we want to secure it this way. Everybody can read data. Only logged in users can write, so create, update and delete data. The types must be correct. Only the owner of the respective data can update and delete the data. A document is just allowed to have the predefined keys. All keys are required to be in the document, only the description is optional. The score can only be between 0 and 10. And last but not least, updates can only be done all 5 seconds to reduce spamming. So let's get started. Since the last video I added some keys, here in the add schools function I added create add and last update. We need that to be able to rate limit our updates. And also here in the edit schools function, anytime we edit the school, we don't just edit the score, but we also edit the last update time. And we do all of that with a Firebase Firestore function, which is called server timestamp. This will give us a date, which looks like this. All right, let's go to our Firestore rules. And we can see we have it open, only creating is reduced to request.auth does not equal null, which means you have to be logged in to be able to create a document. So if you have seen the last video, you already know that. But today we're going to add a lot of rules, so we want to have it a little bit more readable. What we can do with Firestore rules is add functions. And instead of writing that out every time, we can just call is signed in up here. And as we said in the beginning, we want users just to be able to create, update and delete if they're signed in. And that's how we can use functions in our Firestore rules. Then now let's add another function, which we call isValidSchool. And here we want to check the types that go into our database. So here on the right side, we can see all the keys we have for our new school object. And now we want to check our request.resource.data. So if you remember from the first video, this is the incoming data. And we want to append dot title is string. And request.resource.data.description is type string. And a better way to do that is taking a parameter. And then once we call the function, we put request.resource.data in as an argument. And then we can prepend school here. And this works the exact same way. But another thing is if we want to add that for all of our keys, this will be a lot of manual work. The same with all the other functions we want to implement today. So let's delete all of that because we can do that way easier with the tool I built. Here's an open source project I host, which is called CodeSnip Generator. And we have here a graphical user interface where we can do these rules way, way easier. So one example is a thing that we already did before where we can specify that only signed in users are allowed to create, update and delete. And down here, the function is automatically created and appended to the allow statements. So let's start with our type checking. First, we want to add our collection name, which in our case is schools. So this collection name. Then we want to add a name for our variable. In our case, we want to name that school. And now we can add all the keys we want. So to do that easier, I have the keys here on the right side. So let's just start with title. Then title is type of string. And then title should not be empty. And then also title should be a required key. That means that our Firestore rules check if in the new school there is a key named title. 
but we'll have a closer look afterwards how that exactly works. So we just check that and then we could add a condition equal or no equal, but we don't want to do that. So let's just add it. And now here in the list, we can see title type string, not empty and is required. So let's add the next key. Description is type string. This can be empty because we said this is the only optional field. So it doesn't need to be required as well. And we don't have to add a condition either. So let's just add that. Then the next one is score, which is type number. Again, this should be not empty and required. And now we want to add a condition. This should be between zero and 10. Let's add that. Then let me just add the other three. And now for the created ad, we have a special type, which is called timestamp. Timestamp is a type that Firebase console gives the timestamp. So if you go here, we can see timestamp is type of this element. Whereas here, the description, for example, is string. But timestamp here in our JavaScript is just an object. So sometimes types in Firestore security rules can be different than in our JavaScript. This should be required and not empty as well. And the same thing with last update. So you can see how easy it is. And now we have all of our keys. And now if you go down here, we can see our Firestore validation has a new function is valid school. And here we have all of our keys that are checked. So you can imagine if you use this tool, you will spend around 30 seconds for this. If you had to write it out by hand, this would take you at least 20 minutes. And now here is valid school has been added automatically as well. And of course for updating too. A question you might have here in our edit school, we just have score and last update. So there we won't have title, ID, description and all of the other keys. But don't worry, this will still work because the Firestore's rules will look at the document as it would be at the end of editing. So it will check if you update the document, what the keys will be like at the end. This is called having a hydrated document. So let's go back to our tool. And now we can add the next check, which is owner access. So only owner has access to create, update and delete. And then we want to add our owner selector, which in our case is owner. So this should be the key where we check which is the owner ID. So in our application, this will be owner. So in the tool here is owner has been added and this checks the request.auth.uid with school.owner. School comes here as a parameter which is an argument in our is owner call. And these can be a little complicated, so bear with me. Here in create, we have the argument request.resource.data. If you remember, request.resource is the incoming data. So when a user creates a document, we will check the incoming data if the auth UID is actually the school owner. So nobody can fake the owner data because we know we can't trust data coming into our database. So you might ask yourself, why can we trust this one? This comes in from the client side as well. But Firebase does a lot of checking in the back end on this auth object. So it really can be trusted. So if a user is logged in, the auth object with the user ID will be sent as well as the request.resource.data object. So we check the auth user ID is equal to the school.owner. And this is how we can be sure that not somebody can come in here and invent some kind of user ID that might belong to another user. With deleting, we don't use request.resource.data, we only use resource.data, which is the existing data in our database. So in other words, we check if the auth UID we can trust is equal to the owner's ID, so users can only delete their own data. And with update, we actually check both. So we check if the user ID is actually the real ID and not just some fake ID. And then we also only allow users to update the data where they're the current owner. So now we validated the types and the conditions. We checked if the user is signed in and we checked if the user is actually the owner of the document that he or she wants to write to. So now let's go up here and let's work on keys checking. So in our application, we want no matter what happens that every document has title, score, ID, owner, owner email, created that, and last update as a key. So for that, we just check this and we go down here to see what happened. So we can see when somebody wants to create a document, the check keys has been added here and with updating as well. So what does check key actually do? 
Jackie takes in a required fields. With the Firestore security rules, we can now use variables with let. And all the required fields we said in the beginning, because we checked this box, will be put in here in this array. So you can see we have all the keys. The only one that's missing is description, because this is what we said optional. And now we can check if request.resource.data, so in other words, the incoming data, we have a keys method here that gives us back an array of keys has all, which is another method of Firestore security rules, and then this required fields. So in other words, we check if these fields exist in our incoming document. And again, that also works with updating, as Firestore security rules look at the hydrated document and not the actual document coming in. Then the next thing we can check is only current keys are allowed. So if we check that and go down here, we can see optional fields has been added, and an all fields variable has been added as well, which is required fields. So this one up here concatenated with optional fields, which is this one. So because we didn't check the description up here, the description has been put in as an optional field. So we're not just checking if the keys have all required fields, but we also check if the keys of the incoming data has only all fields. So that means if somebody would like to add another field, let's say, owner2, this wouldn't work. So the last thing we want to do is rate limit our update. So we want to limit our users to be only able to update every five seconds to reduce the possibilities of spamming our database. With that, we need the timestamps I've added, which in our example are called last update. So that's this one. So let's go to our tool and check what's happened. So in update, we have a new function call, which is called isCom. And isCom checks the request.time is greater than resource.data. So the existing last update timestamp and adds a duration value, which is a method of Firestore rules with five seconds. So users can only update their data every five seconds. So now we have all our rules in place. What we can do is go up here and copy all the rules, go to VS Code, our rules. And what I like to do is delete all of the rules and add the new ones. So if you save that, there's only one thing to do before we deploy the rules. And this is that we have to explicitly say that this up here equals to true. So everybody can read our database. Let's save that, open a new terminal. And then with the command we learned last time, which is Firebase deploy flag only Firestore's rules. We can deploy our rules and we can see there are no errors. And now our Firebase security rules should work as expected. So let's test that out. Let's refresh the page. And now we're not locked in at all. So we shouldn't be able to edit or delete anything. So we can see that doesn't work. So if you delete it, it won't work. If you want to edit something, it won't work. And if you would like to add something, it doesn't work either. For all of them, we got missing or insufficient permission. So let's log in now. So we're now logged in as jim at gmail.com. So now we should be able to edit our documents. So our application works in a way that if we have a score here, we can edit the score down here and this should change to five, what it did because this is a document from jim at gmail.com and we shouldn't be able to do that on a document of pat at gmail.com. So let's try to change that and we can see we get an error. So that all works fine. So let's check out if our rate limiter works. So let's try to add another score here and then quickly afterwards inside of five seconds, another score and we can see it doesn't work. So our rate limiter works as well. And then now we're currently logged in as jim at gmail.com. So let's pretend that we are some hacker and we have our own front end application where we pretend that we are another owner. So let's say we hack Pat's user ID, which we can take from here. And let's put that in here. So now the owner does not come from up here, which is the current user ID, which comes from our Firebase authentication, but we just manually put it in here. So let's save that. Let's go back to our application. Let's refresh. So we're now logged in as jim at gmail.com. But if we add a document, the owner ID will be actually Pat's user ID. So let's add school X three and some kind of description. And we can see it doesn't work missing or insufficient permission. So our rules work fine. 
Then of course, with a real world application, we don't want just the errors here in the console. So if we do something that is not permitted, like adding a score of 11, we want it to be indicated to the user. So that's why client side, we should add validation too. So for example, our method add school should only allow to add a new school if all the conditions are met by our Firestore rules as well. So of course, now we would need to duplicate that and write it into JavaScript. But if you go back to our tool, you can see down here, we have our JavaScript validation as well. So we can just copy that, go to our application, go to our component, then add this function here, which is called isValidSchool. Then we can go to our add schools function and add a simple if check. So we check if is valid school returns true with new school as an argument, because this function will return true if all the conditions here are met. So if true, only then we will add the document to our database, else we alert something wrong. If we save that and go back to our application, and let's try to add a school with a score of more than 12. We can see we get an alert even before we get an error here. Now, of course, we don't really know what happened. For that, we can go back to our tool again, and we have JavaScript validation, which is advanced, which works a little bit differently. So let's copy that, go back to our application, delete our isValidSchool function and paste our new function. And this will return false if it's not a valid school. So what we need to do here is go to is valid school and change to is not valid school and reverse that. And then we return is not valid school here in our alert, because this function will return a description of what actually went wrong. So let's save that and go back to our application and let's add a school with a score of 12. So more than 10. Let's add that and we can see error in school.score. And that's how the code snippet generator works. Of course, we still get errors. So if you want to delete Pat's school entry, so what we most probably would want to do is if the current user ID does not equal to the document's owner, that we hide the delete and edit button. But I will cover that in a future video. So make sure to subscribe to not miss that. But we can see with the Firestore's rules, even if we don't do that, our database is secured. So I hope this video helped. As always, the link to the tool and to the code base is in the description down below. Don't forget the code snippet generator is an open source project. So if you would like to contribute, you're very welcome to do that. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments down below. See you in the next video.